There are 3,150 technology companies in the world today, as listed by Bloomberg. Only 345 of those attained a compounded annual growth rate of over 25% for five consecutive years. Of those 345, only 13 generated revenues greater than $2.5 billion. And of those 13, merely eight had a market cap greater than $5 billion. HCL Technology, specialized in transformation of IT and engineering services across 31 countries, is a $4 billion enterprise today. We think it's a good time to reveal our magic mantra for success. An idea that doubled our company's quarterly revenue during the recent recession, doubled our number of $10 million and $20 million customers, and tripled our $50 and $100 million customers in just the last three years. It's the same secret formula that got us featured in TPI's list of top six IT service providers by value of deals won across the world and got us featured in the first ever executive dream team compiled by the Fortune magazine. So here it is, the secret to our success. Are you ready? It's called the get everything you want machine, a simple one button device that takes all our business and client problems and with a single press, boom, they're all solved. Retails at $59.95. Call now and we will throw in a free peace of mind pencil. If only life were that simple. Although it seems a little absurd, maybe it can be. Because our secret problem solver is more powerful than any machine. It's the idea that when you channel the energy of 80,000 employees across 31 countries into one funnel, you can very well solve any problem. It's called employees first, customers second, and it's behind everything we do. Imagine you are on a ledge of a building, which is three story high. Imagine that building is on fire. You have two choices, stay or jump. Assuming that you have data, analytics, advisor, whatever it is, you know the right answer is to jump. How long will you take to convert the thought to jump? Five seconds, 30 seconds, two minutes. Let's make the story a bit more complicated. Let's assume that you are standing on a ledge of a building which is three floor high. And your colleagues are standing with you, 10, 100, and let's assume that you're the only one who knows the right answer is to jump. What would your colleagues do? Would they jump because you say that's the right answer? Would they stay because you say jump? <laughs> or would they stay confused? The reason I'm asking that question is it defines organization effectiveness and ineffectiveness. It's never the idea, it's the execution. I have always wondered Gandhi when he landed in India. Did he have the idea of how he will get independence for India? Yeah. Did he know what non-violence potentially could do? Yeah. Did he know what India wanted, which is independence? Yeah. Then why did he take so many years? Why did it take so many years to implement that idea? Why did it take so many years to tell us, to get us independence? When, when he landed on the Indian shores, he exactly knew what we wanted. He exactly knew how to get it. But why did it take so many years? That's the difference between success and failure. It's never the idea. It's the way the idea is implemented. So what is the idea? A disclaimer. I'm not a professor. I don't read too many books. I'm an experimenter. I'm the guy who asks a lot of questions. I was fortunately part of an experiment which worked, an experiment which led to a growth of revenues, market cap, profitability by 600% in the peak of recession. So this story is about how did it happen. 
In hindsight, it looks very beautiful. In foresight, it was very troublesome. <laughs> so I found myself standing on a ledge of a building in 2005. Hsil Technologies, an IT services company, was losing mind share, market share, talent share. Everybody in the world, including the aunts and uncles and grandmothers and grandfathers, knew about it, other than the 30,000 people who were inside the company. <laughs> inside the company, we were trapped in our past. In 1962, we were number one. In 1972, we were the first in the world. We were slicing and dicing the data to somehow appear number one. Now forget about the background in which I found myself in that position because the chairman asked me to come and lead the company and I didn't want to because I was one of the startup guys. When I came, I was aghast to know that everybody was trapped in the rear view mirror. And the story goes like this, and I asked myself that when a plumber comes to fix a leak, that's the reason you hired a CEO. Do you tell him how your $20 million house looks or what are the beautiful paintings or how beautiful the garden is? Do you take him to the leak and tell him, here is the leakage? <laughs> and for 90 days, I was told how beautiful the paintings were and you know, how the garden was. And I said, why did you hire me? So I found myself standing on the ledge of the building where all employees, most of the employees, were very convinced that the, burning, the building was not burning. So the first thing I had to do was burn the building. So I went about, and that's called the mirror, mirror exercise, showed the mirror to everybody and saying, mirror, mirror on the wall, you're the ugliest of all. <laughs> and that took a lot of courage to do. And I did that, predominantly because I'm, I've been in HCF for all these years. I did that because I personally believed that this organization had everything which they needed to succeed, other than the fact they were not aligned correctly. So the mirror mirror exercise, you know, I was called all kinds of names, which I'm still called. But I have teenagers, so I've been trained for it. <laughs> and slowly the company started waking up to its irrelevance. So we stopped. We start throwing the dirty linen in public and saying these are the broken things. That's the first thing. We did mirror mirror on the wall. The second thing was defining an aspiration for future, which is so compelling that people will jump up from the bed and go for it. One of the big learning for me in that lesson was the fact that aspiration is never about the companies. So when you define an aspiration that we want to be a hundred billion dollar company, we want to be number one, we want to break this market share, you want to do that, but what is in it for me? Somebody asked me a very interesting question this afternoon in terms of why do young people want to go out and do crazy things rather than join companies? It's because there is nothing in for them in our companies. Our companies are dull, boring, stupid, dead. Is the way they see it. If that's the way the employees see it, and you define a vision that will be number one in 10 years, or will be $40 billion. So the vision which we define, now let, let, let me take a minute to define. The vision I defined is by this question. I asked the 30,000 employees, and I used to meet them 5,000 at a time, is when somebody asks you, where do you work? What is your answer? And I give you three choices. Choice one. <laughs> choice two, I work for an IT services company. And choice three is HCL. Tell me honestly. 90% of them did <laughs> I said, my vision of HCL is, by the time we reach 2010, 90% of you, when somebody shakes hand, you will say HCL. And the response will be, wow, HCL. The reason I defined the vision, and that time people called me stupid, weak, weak leader, without ideas, you know, all that stuff. But the reason it was important to define a personalized vision is because the reason Gandhi succeeded, because the vision was about freedom. And the vision about freedom was what would it mean to a citizen to be a free? And he went at great lengths to explain that. And once people got that, what it would mean to be free, then they were unstoppable. So mirror, mirror, and then define a vision for tomorrow, which is very exciting and compelling for people to jump up from the bed and go and work for it.
And the third step was series of experiments. There is no big idea. I don't believe in innovation. I believe in series of experiments. I like a dog. When a dog has to search for a thief, what does he do? He smells the first step, then the next step, then the next step, then the next step. That's what innovation is all about. Series of experiments. Take a step at a time. Big, bold steps, but step at a time. And therefore, we did series of experiments to transform HCL. But before we go there, we asked ourselves a fundamental question on innovation, which is very interesting. So when you are on a burning platform and you have the company which is ready to transform, transform means change the form. So when you change the form, you must understand it is an irreversible process and it's a painful process. So you should be very clear that you want to change the form. So when you change, want to change the form, you have two choices to innovate on the what axis in terms of what you do, products, services, markets, pricing, proposition, positioning, or how you do it. So there is an interesting axis on culture. And the question I asked is, was there an opportunity for us to create a competitive advantage on the how axis, not on the what axis? Because the how axis was not occupied, and it could be created a competitive advantage because nobody was thinking about how axis. Can culture be a competitive advantage? When I looked at the Japanese car makers in the 80s, they took on the US car makers not on the what cars they manufactured, but how they manufactured. In IT services, can that be done? So we asked ourselves the fundamental questions. First, what is the core business we are in? Second, how do we get to grow faster than our competition? Differentiated value, proposition for the customer, to customer to see us uniquely, different compared to our competition, clear. Third question, where does this competitive differentiator get created? Where is this competitive differentiation? In services economy, it is in the, in the interface of our employees and our customers. Let's call that the value zone. The zone where our employees touch the customer employees. So, so far we concluded to grow faster than our competition, we have to differentiate in innovation, and that innovation is an experience we deliver where all technologies come together to solve business problem in the interface of our customers and our employees. Okay, that was easy. Fourth question. So if our employees are the differentiation which we are delivering to our customers, or the employees are the source of differentiation we're delivering to our customers, what should the business of managers and management be? And the answer was obvious, to enthuse, encourage, enable those employees to create the differentiated value so that the company can grow faster. Hence, employees first, customer second. Now, that was still easy. So we had taken a decision to innovate on the how axis, and we have come to a conclusion that this is a logical way to grow faster than our competition, which we do. We, we outgrew our competition one is to two during that period. But the question is, how do you implement it? How do you make this possible? So we went through a four-step process. Now, these four steps are hindsight <laughs> processes. This is not the way it happened in foresight. Foresight, for every good thing I say, there were 100 mistakes. <laughs> so the first step there was creating trust. How do you create trust? Nobody trusted the management. Everything which I said was taken with a pinch of salt. So I said we will push the envelope of transparency to such an extent that it will shake the confidence of the employee that the management can do that. And there is no option the employees will have to trust the management. So all the dirt of the company, I put it on a digital platform and shared with the company. This is broken, this is broken, this is broken, this is broken. And the reason I did that, number one, there was no gossip in the company anymore because everybody knew what's broken. Number two, my belief was if you know what is broken, somebody will fix it because I can't. <laughs> so that was creating trust through transparency. And there was a series of experiments which we did to create trust. The second was make the enabling functions enable. Long ago, God created enabling functions because God created fear. So we were afraid that employees are going to run away with money, so we created finance, HR, you know, quality control, all kinds of enabling functions, and suddenly the enabling functions don't enable anymore. They control. And I don't have a problem with control because that's the way the society has moved. But I have a problem with the fact that the, are you enabling or not? So again, we brought an innovation 
on opening trouble tickets. So any employee can open a trouble ticket on HR, on finance, on quality, on anybody, and they have to solve the problem in a certain period of time. But the innovation we brought in there, which was very interesting, is that I don't want the tickets to be there in the first instance. So I want you to get me a zero-day ticket. That means a day where there's no ticket. In the first week when we launched this, there were 70,000 tickets opened. <laughs> and all my colleagues celebrated. We had a party. I was there. We celebrated that we have captured 70,000 tickets till one girl, 23 years old, told me, Vineet, you are stupid. And I said, I know, but tell me why. He says, <laughs> in no other organization, a CEO celebrates 70,000 tickets. So anyway, we started celebrating zero tickets. So that was the second. And the third, which was very interested, invert the organization pyramid by making the management accountable to the employees. In 2005, 90 days after my taking over, I, I asked those 30,000 employees to do my appraisal, electronically, confidentially, with identity not disclosed, and the results of that was published for the employees to see, and I said, if my scores go below certain thing, I'm gone. They didn't believe it's gonna happen. I survived the first year. I did the second year. So the last time, 90,000 employees in 32 countries did my appraisal along with 6,500 other managers, their appraisal, and the results were published on the web. We really demonstrated that the management is in the business of enthusing, encouraging, enabling the employees to do it. Now, why do it? Because of the fourth factor. The fourth factor, which was the most important factor, is transfer the ownership of change to the employees. So what did we do? He says, dear friend, the management is in the business of enthusing, encouraging, enabling. You are in the business of performing. So tell me, why did the performance not happen? So B became a zero excuse culture and a high performance culture. So when the employee said the performance did not happen because of A, B, C, then the next question was, okay, did you ask your manager to deliver A, B, C to you? If you did not, you have to pay the consequences. If you did, then let's talk to the manager. So we did a lot of those things. We started measuring not satisfaction, passion, and there's a huge amount of initiative it took to transfer the ownership of change to the employees. In the end, the how axis is a very ex exciting axis. Even if you innovate on the what axis like Gandhi did, unless you understand how to effectively execute on the how axis, the higher chances of failure are pretty, pretty stark. And the only way you can do it is to think about your teenagers at home. Right? The way you grew up was command and control. Most of the time your parents said something, you would do it. <laughs> if you try and do that to teenagers today, you know what will happen to you. So that organization involvement has to come back to the organization. You have to understand human capital. And only by understanding human capital, you'll get the best out of them. But the journey isn't over. Employees First is a living concept that continues to evolve. While Employees First 1.0 was management-driven, employee-embraced, a contemporary version is emerging today. Employees First 2.0, which is employee-driven, management-embraced. Manifestations of this are evident in initiatives throughout the company. MadJam is an internal crowdsource initiative for frontline employees that enable micro-innovations to gather greater momentum and become employee-led business lines. Over 43,000 employees participated in voting on 647 innovative ideas. MEME is our in-house social and professional networking platform created by Gen Y employees. MEME was an overnight success, cutting across age, location, function barriers. It has today more than 70,000 members. MEME is a vital hub for ideas, collaboration, and company-wide communication. Channel the energy of tens of thousands of employees into a funnel, and you get a powerful fuel that sends your company's engine racing. It's the belief that employees who are passionate about their work and empowered to succeed can offer better value to individuals, to corporations, and to society. And above all else, it's an effort to put the human back in business. Call it the employee's first effect.